Meet Pete. Pete doesn't know it yet, but in three hours and 41 minutes at 7.43 a.m., he will be rushing his pregnant wife, Abby, to the hospital. He won't be thinking about whether his car is charged and able to safely cover the distance from here to there. Because the engineers who designed and built Pete's car already thought all about it. SAE International assembled a team of engineers from all over the world to think systematically about the charging of Pete's car. These engineers developed a series of standards that made mass production of Pete's car safe, affordable, and environmentally sustainable. But Pete won't have to think about any of that. He's probably never even heard of us. And we're fine with that. Because in helping the engineers keep Pete's car fully charged and safe, we've done our job. Sleep well, Pete. Hello, on behalf of SA Detroit section and SA International, we would like to thank you for joining us today. Aside from the panelists, all attendees have been muted. However, we do want you to participate in the conversation by utilizing the chat function. Now that we have this out of the way, I would like to introduce our moderator, Sven Biker, PhD founder and managing director of Silicon Valley Mobility, LLC and lecturer at Stanford University. Take it away, Sven much Roxanne for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody here to the panel discussion reimagining the future of mobility really great to see uh, many of you here dialed in to, to zoom wherever you might be it's still relatively early uh, on my end of the world here in Palo Alto California but I see people also dialed in from Europe that's great uh, even if there may be some from further away. Um, so great to have so much interest in the topic that is dear to um, all of us, I guess, the future of mobility. And as Roxanne pointed out, I, um, I'm a lecturer at Stanford University. I'm an independent mobility consultant and also an external advisor to SAE International. And uh, in that capacity, I'm looking forward to the discussion here with uh, four very esteemed panelists with me. Uh, but before I introduce those panelists um, to you, all of you, let me introduce the topic first, a little bit more what we want to discuss, because mobility is a lot of talk uh, about that. And um, so we want to take it in a specific direction today, because um, we always hear a lot about electric vehicles, autonomous driving, shared mobility. And in a way, all of those describe um, innovation and in technology or business. And, and that's very important. And that's what gets me excited as an automotive engineer. But also, um, there's a lot of talk about accessibility, affordability, sustainability, equity. And these are all the needs that mobility has to address. And quite frankly, has not always done a great job um, addressing those issues and solving the problems that come with them. But Let's take another step back. What does mobility mean anyway? Is it just a fancy word for transportation? Is it about a much broader ecosystem that's now unfolding? And some say that is the physical manifestation of the internet. Well, all those and other topics we want to tackle on this panel. And there's this one very important piece that unites all our panelists. Yes, they all work in the mobility field and are very passionate about it. And they also contributed to Alison Malek's book that is titled Intersection, Reimagining the Future of Mobility Across Traditional Boundaries. And I think, Roxanne, we can put a link to this book into the chat window. So those who want to look it up, uh, I just did it actually. So that worked, that's great. So I definitely encourage all of you to at least take a look at, uh, at the book um, on the online landing page and hopefully you purchase it. And uh, we can already give this away that um, Allison will be at WCX in Detroit next week and do a book signing. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit more about this topic. Um, so we want to talk about reimagining the future of mobility. And let me now first introduce our four amazing experts and contributors to Allison's book. 
Um, let's start with Alison. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, what do you do at the Coalition for Reimagined Mobility? And also uh, this one piece that I took from your chapter that you might want to allude a little bit more to is that you say the first major rethink of the entire transportation system since the mass introduction of the automobile in the 1930s is upon us. So tell us a little bit more about this, Alison. <laughs> Absolutely. You. Thank you so much, Sven. I'm really excited to be here and to be able to, to be here with the panelists and, and really start to dive in on a great discussion around what is the future of mobility. Um, I am the executive director of the Coalition for Reimagine Mobility, which is a global organization shaping policy for the more equitable and sustainable movement of people and goods around the world. Our vision is to create a world where moving people uh, is, and goods is efficient, uh, it's equitable and environmentally sustainable. And so we're really uh, working on the, the policy efforts and advocacy efforts to do that. And I, I see this book is really uh, tightly tied in with the work we're doing at the coalition. Um, for me, when I, I originally talked with SAE about, all right, a book on the future of mobility, one of the things that I thought was really critical is that we have a lot of different perspectives. I, through my career, have been a lot of different things. Uh, I've been an engineer, I've been a venture capitalist, I've been a startup co-founder, now I'm working in policy, all in the mobility space, and have had the opportunity to just frankly see a lot of different facets that I think when we're, you know, a, an automotive engineer or somebody working in freight and logistics, you kind of lose track of the big picture. Uh, and so my, uh, my intention with this book was to pull together a lot of different perspectives on what all is changing, um, because there's a lot. And as we think about how this is so different, uh, the, the, first really big transition of how people get around, there's a lot of technology that is now available that can enable us. Um, so when we think about connectivity and being able to, to see where your package is when it's going to arrive or be able to call a, an Uber or a Lyft or, or get a, a, a scooter or something like that, that's all enabled by technology, which is really exciting and has the possibility uh, to be able to change transportation in ways that we really haven't seen in a hundred years. And that's really exciting. Um, but I think we're, we're just at the starting edge. And so um, one of the things I'm excited about with this book is as we're trying to imagine what that future is and who gets to participate in shaping it, having people that, that understand more broadly what's going on and all of the shifts happening is really helpful to, to drive the conversation. And uh, so I'm very excited about this conversation today, uh, as well as uh, all of the different contributions. And we hope that you enjoy the conversation today. Great. Thanks so much, Alison, for well, that intro statement and, and also for actually assembling all these great experts in, in your book. And again, we have uh, three other experts and contributors to this book here with us today. Uh, let's, let's go to Avinash Rugubur, who's the president of Arrival. And uh, Alison just talked quite a bit about uh, technology. And Avinash, you say in your part of the book, the future of mobility is not just about technology we deploy, but the principles that we use to design mobility solutions. Tell us a little bit more about this and also what you do at Arrival, where you are the president. Absolutely, Sven, and um, thanks for having me. And Alison, good to see you as always. So I think um, we tend to, when we have new technology, we tend to simply replace the old. And I think, well, we've got an opportunity here in the biggest change that the industry has seen, as, as Alison mentioned, in 100 years, is just rethink you know, the way we think about the product portfolio, the experiences we're trying to design, the costs to make it more accessible. I really believe that it drives a fundamental rethink in how we move people in goods. And, you know, if we take the example of the pandemic, the fact that people are spending more time in their homes, um, in a way they are doing transportation. You know, you're still able to go to the office through virtual interfaces like we're doing today. And I think it really, instead of just you know, we have to resist that temptation to simply take new technology. And for example, if you look at um, when we're doing a bus, it's actually a whole rethink about what a bus needs to be and, and its role that it plays. And if you extend that further, you start to see that 
when you rethink the design principles and the production methodology, which I'll talk about in a bit, you really get to be able to think about what's the actual product portfolio that needs to be in place. So if you look at today, we're just simply replacing all those vehicles with electric versions. And I'm not sure that's the right way forward um, for us all around the world, by the way. This is not a US specific thing. This is everywhere. We seem to see the same vehicles, the same form factors. So at Arrival, we have fundamentally designed a new method of uh, producing vehicles and making electric vehicles more affordable um, through vertical integration and rethinking the 150 year old production line. Uh, and we do that using micro factories, which are small warehouses that we can convert into production facilities and produce electric vehicles out of them. You can basically take, uh, take a warehouse in a city and start making it a, a production facility. And through that vertical integration, we design all the components, uh, skateboard, body systems, uh, we are able to create affordable electric solutions, but they can be any form factor we want. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much, Avanash, and great what you're doing with your team at Arrival. So let's get to Valerie Leffler, who is the executive director of Phionix Mobility Rising. And uh, Valerie, if you want to tell us a little bit more about that, and also the quote that I took from your contribution is, that you say, as we strive for a better tomorrow, equity must be a priority. And there are many low tech advances that can easily be made available today. So tell us a little bit more about this, Valerie, and what you do at Freonix. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. So at Phoenix Mobility Rising, we believe in creating mobility solutions for the health and well-being of every person in every community. And a lot of the work that we do is really pivotal and centered around technology, but so often we see things that are just basic systemic issues that get in the way that no matter how great your app is, if there isn't um, cell, cell signal or cell service or, or you know, decent internet capability, it's a non-starter or no matter how sexy and accessible you make that autonomous vehicle, if the sidewalk is not accessible for the individual to get to the vehicle, again, it's a non-starter or it's a limiting factor of how many folks can actually access that vehicle. And so as we work around the United States in our four years, we've launched projects in nine states with OEMs, with major health partners and health systems, as well as 160 community partners. And what we really look to do is break down these barriers that have really existed and, and really, instead of putting folks that have been probably left behind or not a, systemically not given a seat at the table, we put them at the forefront and say, if we can make mobility work for that part of the population that doesn't have access to transit or transit isn't the best option or uh, maybe have other needs that aren't, aren't addressed by the current mobility ecosystem, we make it work for them and then work backwards versus saying, well, we're going to focus on the folks who are at the table and we're having these conversations and then we'll get to them in 20 years. It's almost like when we talk about accessible vehicles. We have accessible buses and there's all this policy around how we create accessible vehicles. But when it comes to accessible bus stops, there's not a lot of discussion around that. There's not a lot of metrics and, and procedures that are put in place. And so those are some of the things that as we're looking about the vehicle tomorrow and the app of tomorrow, we're saying, does it work for screen readers? Um, you know, does it work for individuals who do not have cell phones? You know, really thinking about um, the soup to nuts of that mobility experience from the user's perspective and from the community's perspective is really important. And so we're really excited to just kind of share our input and learnings from our community partners and our passengers as we've worked across the United States. Great. Thanks so much, Valerie. And thanks for doing that great work. Very important, of course. It gets us to John Paraccio, who's a, a strategic consultant in intelligent transportation system sector and the automotive industry. And John, you've been with the industry for a long time, and you start off your chapter in Allison's book by admitting that you are decidedly not a futurist. You have a tough time dealing with the here and now. So John, tell us more about this and what you do in your strategy work. Uh, okay, thank you, Sven, um, and thank you for uh, putting out. I am old, uh, and for <laughs> having not my last. words, <laughs> and having me last. But uh, so 
yes, you've got my day job. I'm I'm a, a strategic consultant in the intelligent transportation systems world. Um, However, uh, I, it has been my privilege to serve uh, as chair of the former Michigan Council on Future Mobility under two governors. I currently serve as a senior advisor to the new Council on Future Mobility and Electrification, and I lead that Council's work group on electrification. Uh, it's also my pleasure to be a member of the Board of Directors of Phoenix Mobility Rising. And so predictably, I share a lot of the um, uh, thoughts that, that Valerie Leffler uh, just outlined about uh, the need for accessibility and equity. Indeed, I, I have a working theory about trans transportation, which is that if we can take care of our most vulnerable travelers, the disabled, the elderly, the children, we can take care of anyone. And we should focus on universal accessibility, not just accessibility for uh, the disabled or folks who are trapped in a cycle of poverty because they simply have no reliable uh, access to personal transportation. So those, those are things that, that uh, are here and now mm -hmm. that trouble me greatly. And I think we can use technology, we can use uh, our political will to address a lot of these things. We just need to get better organized. And we need to uh, have uh, associations like SAE um, you know, become true leaders for other folks who want to address a lot of these uh, uh, outstanding challenges. But uh, yeah, the here and now is troubling to me, although, you know, Allison really pushed me for, for that, that uh, you know, I can only go 20 years. Anything beyond that is, is just mind uh, bending for me. Uh, so I, I tried to focus on what I thought might happen. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much a here and now person. And I uh, really appreciate the big time, John. That, that's somewhat similar for me because I'm also an independent consultant and a lecturer at a business school. And, and I also decided to say, I really don't know what the future is going to look like. I know that it's a mix out of automation, electrification and sharing, and the direction is clear. But the speed at which these trends unfold, that's definitely debatable and the mix as well. And so we want to shed a little bit more light and intelligence onto this topic here in the remaining, uh, what do we have, like, like 40 minutes or something like that. And, and therefore, let's, let's dive into our discussion. And for the audience, how we want to do this, of course, we prepared a few questions to get started. And uh, we want to get through those and then hear from you, the audience. And therefore, please uh, submit your questions via the chat window. I'll do my very best to moderate the discussion, read your questions and decide uh, in which order we take those questions. Uh, but um, I guess we will definitely have a lively interaction in this. To have it even more interactive, uh, we have built out a few polling questions here that Zoom allows so that as we have our prepared questions uh, for our panelists, we want to hear your sentiments, your ideas and your concerns as well from the audience and um, therefore be prepared to interact with us already in this first part where we'll go through our questions. And then in the end, uh, Roxanne will give us a little bit more information also on upcoming events, including SAE's WCX happening in Detroit next week. With that, let's, let's get to the first question uh, for, for our panelists, which is a little bit more about mobility and transportation and what is what. But uh, before we get to our questions, let's also pull out the first uh, survey question for our audience, where we actually wanted to know a little bit more about your background so that we can also craft the discussion a little bit more in that direction. Thanks for putting that up. So basically tell us a little bit more uh, where you typically work or what you're interested in, whether that's the vehicle, the infrastructure services or policy. Um, and we'll definitely get to those topics as well. But to get started with our panelists, um, so we talk about mobility and transportation. Sometimes we use these terms interchangeably. Sometimes we make a big distinction. So um, how do you see that? What is transportation? What is mobility? Is it the same thing? And Alison, let me put you on the spot since <laughs> you curated this book. So what is mobility? What is transportation? 
So I, I, I picked mobility uh, in particular for the title in part because I see the distinction. Um, transportation to me is something that is built, be it a car, be it a road. There's, there's aspects of people coming together to put together transportation. When I think about mobility, I think about even your own two feet. You don't actually need any infrastructure uh, necessarily if your if your legs work to be able to walk around to get places, and as we think about this evolution, um, we've started to confuse the two, especially in the U.S. Mm -hmm. When we think about mobility, we think about cars, and we forget that every single trip, unless you are only walking, is a multimodal trip. We forget because we mm -hmm. just think like, well, I walk to my car in the parking lot or in my garage and I drive to the place and then I walk, but we forget that we actually had a multimodal journey. And this becomes really important as we look towards the future of what we want mobility to look like. We need to take that step back and think about how we want to experience it. And then we can get back down into what transportation needs to do to support where we want to go and how we want to get there. Mm -hmm. And if we can take that perspective, um, I think that that actually will help us to have a broader conversation around what types of mobility options we want to support as a, as a society. Um, and it also helps us to think through all of the movement of our goods. Do we move to them? Do they move to us? I think with the pandemic, most of us have shifted things coming to us instead. And it creates a really interesting dynamic in why do we travel as people um, and what should that future look like in terms of what types of trips are we even going to want to make? Mm -hmm. So it's much more than just a utilitarian perspective of getting from A to B and then measure how long the distance and how much time it takes. It's a lot about personal preference and such. So any anybody else to add to it? I see, John, you are nodding. You're assertive. Um, what is mobility? What is transportation, John? So I was just thinking, you know, I, I really um, am so impressed with Allison and her, <laughs> her answer. I, I absolutely agree with it. Uh, I think transportation serves mobility, not the other way around. So, uh, you know, and the, and the uh, trick is to have the right mode available when you need it with the least amount of friction. I think the the great challenge for for mobility is often um, the intermodal aspect of uh, you know going from transit. Well, huh, let's take a step back. Parking, you know, let's say at a transit terminus point, taking transit, getting to a destination, which may not be your final destination. You may need to walk. You may need to transition to shared ride. Um, and oh, by the way, if we don't do shared ride, we're just going to be adding to congestion as we deploy uh, fully autonomous vehicles, which will be a long, 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 long time from now. But I, I think you get my point. The challenge is to reduce friction. And it's, and it's some basic stuff like uh, transaction management and payments processing. We have to focus on how are we paying for parking? And if I have an electric vehicle, am I also gonna be able to pay for the electricity charging my vehicle? And do I really need a, a, another transaction to get on transit, to get to where I'm going? I, I think we really have the tools today and it, referencing um, uh, Valerie's point about an app, it's yeah. great to have an app, but if you're going through 10 apps to get to three places, that's not so cool. Mm -hmm. Valerie, Avanash, anything to add? Yeah, I think I agree with Allison and John. It, you know, when I think about mobility, I think that is the verb. And I think of transportation as predominantly nouns of, you mm -hmm. know, mobile impact. And I think, you know, a great example of the difference of transportation and mobility. So in St. Louis, there's a lot of work that's being done to reduce infant mortality. And in some of the communities of inner city St. Louis, there's incredible transportation, incredible public transportation, but they have some of the highest infant mortality rates in the United States that rival that of developing nations for African-American babies. And trying to figure out then one of the top issues that those, those mothers and those children face is the mobility to get to doctor's appointments. Yes, there is 
transportation, but putting two small infants on public transportation and taking them two hours to get to their appointment and get to work and get to childcare and all those things is, is a barrier. And so when we think about mobility, that human experience becomes a much, much more intrinsic part. And these families live within five miles of some of the top healthcare in the United States. And so we think about, we have at-risk children within minutes of actual you know, physical services for, for healthcare, and yet they can't get there. Why? We have transportation, but we do not have mobility for these mothers and these children. And so I think that as we're thinking about the future, the app accessibility, the journey planning, the experience of those mothers and children and safety all have to be a part of these conversations in how vehicle and infrastructure and policy is designed. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, very important points. Avinash, the vehicle behind you, some might say, oh, that's all transportation, that's not mobility. So how do you dissect these two topics? Yeah, um, I think that, look, I agree with everybody here. And I think just to double down on it, I think ultimately, Mobility, what we're talking about is access, you know, access at all work, walks of life. It's multimodal, it's at different price points, it's equitable. And I think when we're thinking about it in an integrated way, because transportation is just a segment, you know, mobility crosses so many different segments that when we enable the right mobility solutions for all walks of life, what are we really talking about? Improving access to goods, to healthcare, to schools, to work, to social opportunities, these are things that fundamentally improve our society. And I think that's really a fundamental difference between the two. But to do that, we need to drive, as Valerie mentioned, the right experiences. You know, as John mentioned, how is it integrated? And then as Alison mentioned, how is it equitable? How can everyone get access to this? Mm -hmm. And that's why technology has to be an enabler and not the answer. So mm -hmm. even with this EV vehicle behind me, it's a van. But if it's too expensive, then... What are you really saying? You're saying, okay, only a certain group of people will have access to that, right? And so fighting that challenge um, every day to make the whole system more equitable, I think that is the real transformation of this industry. Right. And, and that's what we want to dive a little bit deeper into. But, but let's first see about the background of our audience. Uh, if we can show the results, um, okay, about half of you are very interested or even involved in the vehicle regarding uh, future mobility topics. Then um, policy is of big importance. And we also got one question already from Prashant uh, about this. We will get to your question um, a little bit later. And then infrastructure is also of uh, big interest to, to our audience and a uh, little bit of other and services as well. So really it's about the vehicle but also the, the, the policy, the, the framework that, um, that enables or um, actually sometimes also hampers things because we also saw that existing policies might not be the right ones for future mobility. But let's talk a little bit more about equity. Avinash, you, you just talked about it in, in greater detail and, and Valerie, John as well, Alison also um, queued it up. So there's a lot of talk about equity and the, the importance I think is, is clear to, to everybody. We had great examples from, from each of you, but what are the challenges and, and what do we need in order to address those equity challenges that we see in, in mobility? Let's see, Valerie, if I can start with you maybe. Sure, absolutely. This is a great question. And I think, you know, it's multifaceted, of course. So we talked a little bit about infrastructure, the sidewalk infrastructure, or, or how people are able to navigate their communities on foot or by wheelchair is, is very critical to be thought about from just that very beginning part of that journey. Um, the other component is zip codes, you know, how and where mobility is at. 45% of Americans don't have access to public transit. So public transit, while an incredible resource, isn't the answer right now for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you've got vehicle design and, you know, the height of the vehicle, the way the vehicle is um, enables car seats or supports and secures wheelchairs or, you know, the ramp and making sure it's not too high, not too low. The, you know, how do you access and call these services with your smartphone? Is the technology accessible for screen readers or visual impairment? 
And then there's all the things within the sensors that need to be required for that equitable mobility. My husband just had brain surgery and his speech is impaired. And so when he's talking to his Google phone, trying to put the address in the phone yesterday, we're on the way to the doctor, he's trying to say it. And of course, his speech is impaired because part of his mouth is, is paralyzed. And so if he were in an autonomous vehicle and they say, where would you mm -hmm. like to go? And he's giving the address, mm -hmm. the auditory, it's not going to be able to recognize his speech. And my mother-in-law is from Oklahoma and how she pronounces addresses is different than how I produce, pronounce addresses. And that's going to happen. And so when we're thinking about how the sensors, the speech recognition, the vehicle component design, I mean, it's this really multifaceted element um, that we really need to start tackling. And we're not going to answer everything, but we've got to figure out what are our priorities and how do we start making progress instead of just saying, well, that's such a big issue. Somebody else is going to deal with, this is really interesting. I'm going to focus on this. Yeah. So very, very important points. And, and also thanks for pointing out a certain bias that a technology might have, right? We'd like to think of technology as a neutral thing that does the same for everybody, but speech recognition is one thing. And certainly seen uh, other examples, in, in, especially in automated driving uh, regarding technology bias or AI bias. Let's also pull up um, as part of this discussion, the next poll for, for our audience, which is what is the biggest challenge regarding equitable mobility? And you can click um, whatever you think is the biggest challenge. You can only select one. And we look forward to, um, to your um, um, remarks. Let's see, um, who else uh, from the panelists here? So, so what are the biggest challenges regarding equity and, and how do we address those? So I uh, think another big yeah, challenge kind of building on what Valerie talked about is this idea that yes, we can, we can fix the sidewalks, we can get speech recognition figured out, which are all really big, hard challenges. Even if we get that figured out, transportation is, is expensive to deliver, it is. Um, but what we fail to appreciate is the value that it creates. And that's where like having provided transportation services in low income neighborhoods, like trying to pull together, like, hey, guys, if we can get those mothers to the hospital uh, for those doctor's appointments, like Valerie talked about, what's the, the cost savings in terms of long-term health implications. You know, Avinash talked about being able to, to get to school, get to work, things like that. What is the value that's created and how do we actually stop looking at transportation as the standalone, almost optional thing? Because frankly, in the world that we live in now, transportation is not an option. It really is required if you want to participate and have a, have a life have health, have access to education, and be able to participate in the economy. And so once we stop treating it as an optional thing and start realizing that it's really a requirement to participate in society, it can change the conversations and even how we think about finding the funding to be able to support these types of services. Mm -hmm. And this is, sorry, so and um, no, just mind. Yeah, this is what I was saying around, it crosses so many segments. This needs systems thinking it it can't be point solutions we, we are putting ourselves into a position and i fundamentally don't believe that if we follow the path that we've taken to date how do we expect it to change so mm -hmm. this is as we're going through these transitional phases between autonomy electrification connected vehicles etc this is the time for us particularly in in sort of my industry where we're actually designing these things to really stop and think about what are we, what future are we trying to create? And I think first and foremost, the organizations have to care. So as the leaders in an organization, we have to be sort of the examples that we care about this, right? The accessibility part, the equitable part. Mm -hmm. If you see some of the work, for example, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, obviously we're, we're, a, we're a company. So obviously profit has to be part of it. But if you, if I look at some of the things that in a different segment, if you look at what Microsoft's doing around accessibility in video games, for example, they are just really starting to trailblaze and get so many more people into, you know, the world of gaming, which has a benefit on both sides. And the systems thinking, when you start to think about it as a whole, Alison mentioned, bringing people to school, bringing people to work, you can't just think about transportation as a segment. And 
the world we live in right now, it's not the one we want. Obviously, we've got drastic health issues, climate, ecological crises. And on our side, we need to take a look. Alison said that um, bringing transportation is expensive. And I agree, it is. But it's partly because we made it so. And we haven't looked yep. into the technologies that we need to to change anything. And I think that's what a lot of the new sort of startups are bringing to this, which is just a fundamental rethink. I personally don't believe that if Tesla wasn't around, that the rest of the OEMs would have shifted to EV strategies. So it takes a catalyst for these <laughs> mm -hmm. things to really push things forward. Definitely agree. So John, let, let's look. Yeah, go, go ahead, John. Oh, oh no, I'll, I'll take your question, but I, I just wanted to, uh, to point out on the uh, expensive yeah. front, <clears throat> just something I read in Automotive News uh, last week. Um, and this is Edmunds, Edmunds.com data. Uh, the average transaction price for a new EV climbed to 60, over $60,000 yeah. in February. And that compared to the average transaction price for all vehicles of 45,500. In addition, EV buyers were paying an average of 1820 over sticker compared with 680 over sticker just because of the supply chain issues, the chip shortage. And I guess the point I'm making is even before electric vehicles, uh, ICE vehicles are expensive, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. expensive. I mean, it's hard to find a, um, a vehicle, a new car for under... $30,000 that, you know, has four doors and, and wheels, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you could buy mm -hmm. something without them, <laughs> right? And it'd be cheaper. And, and you know, the, the, that, that's a challenge, right? But we also have an opportunity. I mean, if you think about it, we qualify people for all kinds of government benefits at multiple levels of jurisdictions in the United States, around the world. We have to start doing that for transportation. We're, for example, we're going to go to a world where the gas tax won't work anymore to fund roadways in the United States. John, right? we're already there. All right. Yeah, we are. The, the, the federal trust fund is essentially bankrupt. It requires Congress to bail it out every year. So road user charging is going to happen. Now, should everybody be charged the same to use the roadways? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And also, I'm very unhappy with tax credits for electric vehicles, because right now, it's my rich friends who are getting tax credits. And as a taxpayer, I, I, got, I have a real problem with that. I like rebates, but I'd like to calibrate those rebates to folks that really need the help to buy these super expensive vehicles. Right. So that, that would be exactly the difference between X equity and equality that not everybody gets the same but you get raised to the same level so um that, that also actually is to pratha goswami's question here that i want to read actually from from the chat window what about pricing of future vehicles and uh, that question was submitted before we got there actually what about the pricing of future vehicles the traditional auto industry is going after evs where often the base price is significantly above its conventional ice internal combustion engine counterpart how will that affect the accessibility and equity? So what can we do? And Avanash, I, I hear you, the, the it, startups are doing a great job. And I don't agree with everything that Tesla or the CEO does and, and, and say, uh, but certainly without them, we would not be discussing electric vehicles the way we discuss them today. But I don't really see startups serving in particular to the underserved uh, when it comes to electrification. And that, that's certainly where, where my environment here, Silicon Valley, is guilty because Silicon Valley typically goes after the most bang for the buck. So how can we change that dynamic that it's not just, you, okay, you get a Tesla Model S or a Rivian or a Lucid or... Um, a Chevy Bolt, you might say, okay, that's a mass-produced uh, electric vehicle, but then it might not be big enough uh, to get your child seats into the, the, the rear of the vehicle or the, the needs that you might have. So it's also not the perfect solution. So how do we break up this conundrum that electric vehicles for now are still somewhat more expensive to purchase? Cost of ownership might be lower, but you don't see this when you buy the vehicle. 
So we basically for now an electric vehicle is a vehicle for the upper half of um, the, the, the spectrum. So Sven, I would say that it takes a lot of work. And when I mentioned that there's a lot of startups in the EV space, I think it's just great because it means that that market is really going to develop. But I don't see, I see a lot of replication of what's happened before, right? And I think that was one of the things that we had decided seven years ago was that we would even challenge the production method. So if you think about the production method of today, billions in CapEx, hundreds of thousands of vehicles, low margin, it pushes everything to a certain vehicle type. And when you simply take the existing vehicle architecture and you switch an ICE for an electric vehicle, essentially what you're doing is you're adding cost. And so fundamentally redesigning how the product design, the product production process, and the actual final product all comes together to make it more affordable is the journey that we really set on. And it's extremely difficult. And it's led to a lot of vertical integration um, where you, you're controlling cost and capability on every single component. For us, it's meant we don't use uh, steel. So no metal stamping on our body panels. It's a fully recyclable composite material. Um, starts as a fabric and ends up as a panel. But that's a, that's a ton of innovation. And that's what I mean where the technology enablers, that's where we need to be focusing on because the vehicles, the lagging output, it, it's the thing that comes out at the end. But what we've got to really be engineering and innovating on is all of the, let's call it Lego pieces that go up, go into making a vehicle. And that's how you end up down the line, you know, when, the, when, the, when these companies release their products four or five years down the line that they are affordable. It's by starting at the right cost blocks in the first place and, and doing the innovation there. Mm -hmm. So yep. that's going to take time. I think Arrival's whole value proposition is around creating affordable electric solutions. And I said, we started earlier on this, but that is going to be the continuous challenge of driving the cost down towards ICE and then even below. I mean, fundamentally, it's a vehicle of a few thousand parts compared to 100,000 parts, right? And these electric commodity prices obviously going up but they're much simpler vehicles but then i also question why does it need to be a car the way mm -hmm. we know a car to be why is that something totally different right. we don't have the restriction of putting a big engine in front of the driver we have a drivetrain down the middle we have a diff at the end i mean we fundamentally changed the whole architecture right, so right. why why aren't we having different vehicle types that are cheaper? I think yeah, I was going to ask Alison as an automotive engineer, right? So you worked at a very large car company for quite some time. And what do you think? Can a equitable and affordable vehicle be one that is not mass produced? Or does it only come with certain economies of scale that you get a cheap vehicle? I think that's actually the wrong conversation. <laughs> Okay, bring it on. Um, when we when we think about how people get around, we started with this idea of mobility versus transportation. We just got into talking about vehicle design, not mobility, not how are people getting around. I think Avinash started to touch on it with other form factors. When we think about um, scooters, bikes, things like that, there's a lot of opportunity for different price points. We just need to expand our thinking beyond sort of four, four doors and, and four wheels. Uh, but I think there's another aspect of this that we also need to be honest about, specifically for cars and why this conversation about different form factors matters. Most affordable cars are not new. Most mm -hmm. people that, that need access mm -hmm. to cost-effective transportation are going to buy a used car. Some of the used cars I've purchased in my life have been around two thousand dollars, and that that was a little while ago. But like, not that, not forty five, not sixty, seventy thousand dollars. And when we think about EVs in particular, there's a huge opportunity for recycling the batteries as the vehicle reaches end of life, either recycling or reuse. But that means that there's going to be a whole lot of value still in that quote unquote used car. And it's not necessarily going to make sense to keep the used car market as we experience it today going. Mm -hmm. So Super even as we're talking about new vehicle purchases, we're, we're kind of skipping over used vehicles, which are a huge and important part right. of the access segment. That may not even be there. Definitely. And so that is why it's so important that we talk about things like, like bikes and making sure there's, there's infrastructure for bikes to be you know, used safely. Uh, thinking about three-wheelers. I actually uh, 
just bought an electric cargo bike to be able to get around town because I didn't want to spend $70,000 on a new car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that felt more cost effective and, and could meet the needs that I had for most trips. Right. But like really shifting our thinking becomes even more important as we look at some of these secondary effects that are going to come as we make this much needed transition to electric vehicles. We need to be thinking about mobility and options. Yeah. So yeah, Valerie? Yeah, and if I can just add on that, when we think sure. about the, the mobility ecosystem and when we think about vehicle use, scooters, public transit, taxis, TNCs, so on and so forth, I think the enabling factor that I think will really support the growth of all modes is this, this mobility wallet, this technology-enabled ability for the government to subsidize a mobility wallet so that individuals who need that resource have that access. We subsidize housing, we subsidize childcare, we subsidize food access. And is there public transit that has paratransit? Yes. But many times in order to book a ride on paratransit or even public transit in rural communities, you have to book three days out. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. only travel between eight and four on certain parts of the city. And life as, as a parent, as an employee, as a grandparent doesn't exist in that narrow definition. And by creating a mobility wallet, you could create something that can be subsidized by states, by cities, by counties, by sales tax, by um, we, we have transportation that's funded by oil tax credits. We have transportation that's funded by lottery subsidies. We're pretty creative at financing things mm -hmm. in the U.S. But I think those, those enabling factors that allow a tech startup to plug into a mobility wallet enables them to be successful because in venture capital, right? I want to find somebody who's going to make me some money on my investment. And chances are when you're saying, oh, I want to, I want to focus on underserved or underutilized populations that do not have $70,000, they're like, no, I, I really want something back for my cash, you know? So they're yes. not saying yeah, that's, that's the target market. So I think that there's definitely some, some ways that the, that that can, technology can enable a more equitable multimodal yeah. service. Great. So let, let's see actually what our audience thinks about um, what are the biggest challenges regarding um, equitable mobility. Okay, it almost looks like, well, do I take the first, second, third? So it's a breakdown. Affordability is the, the biggest uh, concern that uh, our audience sees, followed by accessibility and availability. Um, safety um, is, is a lower topic here, but but really that it is too expensive. And what has been interesting to do these polls um, like two months ago before uh, gas prices skyrocketed, uh, but I guess we would have seen somewhat similar picture here in this, but that, that's definitely very, very helpful. So where, where I want to go with this discussion is a little bit more specifically about automation, so self-driving vehicles at some point, autonomous vehicles and, and electrification, and how these topics are different for people versus good transportation. And uh, in parallel, we're gonna queue up the next um, survey question for our audience. Um, like, just imagine, you could um, only pick one. If only one was possible, should automated driving self-driving vehicles, focus on people or good transportation. So do you rather want like a little delivery robot or do you want like your robo taxi? Do you want like your um, self-driving truck on a highway or do you rather take uh, the self-driving um, city bus? So I know it's a very hypothetical question, but let's see if people value the solution being approached for people or for goods uh, higher. So with this, um, let's, let's talk a little bit more broadly about these topics. So people in goods transportation, and we're talking about self-driving and electrification, what are like the inherent differences um, when you look at automation, electrification, people or goods transportation? Um, I don't know, Avinash, does that sound like an arrival question? Yeah, are I you think... working on, on goods and people transportation or do you pick one? Uh, we're doing both. So obviously we've got the delivery van, but we've also got the bus that we're doing. Um, we're also doing a ride sharing vehicle with Uber. So, I mean, it's a very difficult question. Both Alison and I were, you know, at the birth of sort of this 
at least OEM revolution of um, autonomous uh, together. And I think the sector accounts for, the transportation sector accounts for the largest slice of US greenhouse gas. So if you're thinking about it from that point of view, I think the commercial vehicle in terms of goods delivery is probably going to be the fastest to transition. But it's always an interesting question because if you think about things like buses, for example, the driver plays a larger role than simply driving a bus. There is a safety aspect, there's a helping aspect, there's a social aspect to that, that we shouldn't just discount in our drive to autonomous. And right now, if you look at autonomous technologies and the price point, there is, before that payback to Valerie's earlier point about the investment community, right? That's gonna go to a particular part of the, of the, um, uh, of society uh, before it transitions out. And when I think about that globally, and I think about, you know, places in Africa and places in, in Asia, how that's going to transition over to AV, I still think, although, you know, I was at the start of sort of this transition across, I still think it's a long way away before that's equitable. So I don't necessarily know which one is going to happen first, but I think there are certain types of transportation, like goods delivery to rural areas where it might not economically make sense to, to have a person, um, where it might be better, especially in terms of like healthcare delivery out, things like that. So I would say goods if, I, if you force me to pick one. <laughs> mm. um, John, do you want to add anything to it? What do you see in the industry? Goods oh, or people transportation yeah. for electrification and automation? Yeah, so so I, I, I have to be honest, um, you know, fully autonomous vehicles really scare the hell out of me, uh, just personally. Um, I think uh, especially when we're talking about uh, these things in mixed traffic, uh, I, just, I just don't understand how that's going to work uh, from a technology and safety perspective. I do think there's an opportunity on longer haul where we segregate uh, highly automated or fully autonomous, maybe partial operation of, of autonomous uh, uh, and I think, you know, class A trucks taking goods, that, that gives me a level, you know, some comfort uh, that that could be operated safely. But I'd just like to point out, you know, I, I, I often do this and I, I, you know, if somebody on this has, has heard me speak before, I, I really am fascinated by automotive recalls because we're going to be asking these same OEMs to make these highly automated and fully autonomous vehicles. So like in 2020, this is from SAE. I just think that's great. I'm using SAE data. There were 300 new light vehicle recalls affecting 28 million vehicles. In 2019, we had 17 million new passenger vehicles sold, 28 million recalled, not including Takata airbags. And the largest <laughs> campaign was 3.5 million. I won't say who the manufacturer was, and this was for brakes. Mm -hmm. So if we have trouble with brakes, I'm a little concerned about fully autonomous, especially in mixed traffic. Yeah, I definitely agree. And um, so I also want to read one statement, I think um, mold into a question here from Stephen Woodward. Uh, and, and that's maybe something, Valerie, that we can discuss a little bit more. What actually a driver has, has a role um, on a school bus, for instance. So Stephen says, our local school district has 50% school bus utilization. Roads are clogged with parents taking the kids to school. They claim safety of the bus is an issue, as well as the social issues of bullying, and other things kids have to deal with these days. Clearly accessible, not working for everyone. Uh, Valerie, any, any thoughts on this? That's maybe also what mobility in the end is. You can say, well, there's a school bus, but is it safe to ride? Is it still safe if it's a self-driving school bus where there's not even a driver anymore who can say, well, kids behave? Yeah, well, there's a lot of that, and there's a lot of dimensions to that question. I think I'll start with the first that came mm -hmm. to mind when I saw that comment was the policy regulations mm -hmm. that come in around school public transportation and even things if, as basic as like in a lot of communities, public transit can't start within two to three miles of the school 
bus of the school location. So you have children walking, small children walking two to three miles, and in many times inclement weather. That is not a safe alternative for the, a lot of those at-risk children. And the, the regulation of school buses and for public transit to provide school transportation gets very muddy and creates a lot of barriers one way or the other in a lot of communities where, well, that's a school bus that has this set of policies. Well, this is public transit. It has this set of policies. And there's different permits, different regulations. But I, I think going back to that, I, I really don't believe you'll ever see a fully autonomous school bus unless there's like a dedicated lane specifically mm -hmm. for that bus. Um, because I'm, I'm a kind of in John's camp when it comes to fully autonomous vehicles scare me to death. Um, but I think that that public transit vehicle or any type of public infrastructure is going to need a driver or, or a, a attendant to support whether that be the same, my, my father is now a bus driver, retired, drives the bus. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, two thirds of his job is classroom management on that bus <laughs> and, and not driving the vehicle. It's Bobby sit down, Susan quit, you know, torturing so-and-so. It's those kind of things. Yep. And so that public transit or the bus driver doing that support or even when it came to, we were part of the US um, Accessible Design Challenge and we brought in public transit drivers to provide feedback on this ramp that one of the um, uh, vehicle manufacturers was working on for their autonomous vehicle. And they said, well, you know, what happens if the ramp breaks? What happens if the vehicle's on fire? What happens if they don't have a smartphone to request the ramp? What happens if they can't reach X, Y, and Z? What happens if they have a, a um, a question about where they're going. That driver really turns into a care attendant. I mean, you think about elevators. They used to have a care attendant on mm -hmm. the elevator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, when we were talking with the public transit drivers, they weren't threatened that their jobs were at risk by this new innovation because they know their role will simply change. And, and I think that this this public transit or school bus transportation, it's a great opportunity where these are huge vehicles that are underutilized, mm -hmm. like, and, and millions of dollars of U.S. infrastructure gets spent on school transportation for these buses that are only in service two, three hours a day that could be go, going to employment or other resources where you have grouped trips. And so, I have all sorts of stuff. I could talk all day, but I'll let yeah, you know, yeah. No, in. I think it's a great, great example. We, we, we do have the means. We just need to deploy them a little bit more smartly. Alison, you've worked on autonomous and electric vehicles. So what do you say for goods or for people transportation? So I think going back to that idea about VCs liking venture capitalists, liking to go where the money is, there is so much pain right now in the movement of goods. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about the chip shortage. I'm sure many people have seen the, the 60 ships off the coast of uh, Los Angeles waiting to get into the port of LA Long Beach. I just think that there's such a pain point in the movement of goods right now that there's a huge opportunity and probably willingness to, to spend for the more expensive technology. And it's 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 well suited where it's at right now. Um, as John talked about, long haul trucking is a great opportunity to be able to use autonomous technology, even if it's not fully autonomous, being able to support drivers so things are moving more safely. Um, and as we think about the different parts of the trip uh, that goods take, being able to actually leverage the, the level of data that needs to be shared for autonomous vehicles can unlock a lot more mm -hmm. operational efficiency in the freight sector that frankly is stuck in, I'm being generous here at the 1970s. <laughs> and so I just see it as like such an exciting opportunity. Like we're talking, we've talked a lot about passenger transportation. There's been a ton of innovation that we've all been yep. able to access um, in one way or another. The freight sector really hasn't seen it. And it's a really huge opportunity space where I think the tech where it's at today is well suited. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that's, that's where it ends up. Great. So let's see how about our audience. So what does the audience think where automated vehicles should be deployed? Okay, um, it's one third, two thirds, so easy numbers. I hope there's, there's more than uh, four or uh, three people answering that. Um, so so that's, that's, I think, a pretty strong statement to look at goods transportation. We, we are at time, uh, but there, there's one thing that we did uh, discuss that we wanted to, at, 
at least get to. And that's how do we finance all of this? And let's say we, we can maybe run five minutes over whoever needs to drop off, not from the panelists, panelists should stay, <laughs> uh, but we'll have another five minutes maybe. How do we finance all of this? We talked about data and accessibility and the infrastructure and the vehicles cost a lot of money and incentives. So should we just look to uh, Uncle Sam and say, well, okay, um, if you want transition, you have to pay for it. Or how is it going to work? Um, who wants to take that shot? John, good. So uh, I, I, somebody else said this, I, uh, not me, but I think it, it makes sense. You know, people talk about we need the federal government to finance this, that, and the other thing. There's no such thing as federal dollars, state dollars, city dollars. There are dollars. OK, mm -hmm. they're coming. They're coming from us. So that's not to say that units of government at different levels shouldn't invest in transit, because Allison made a great point about I'm not sure we're uh, taking into account the value of economic development associated with investing in things like transit, micro transit and other mm -hmm. forms of transportation. But let's be honest with ourselves. These are our dollars. We have to figure out how to uh allocate tax taxpayer money uh in different contexts of transportation at the end of the day for many modes of travel it will be the user that will pay okay and right now you know allison also made a great point the gas tax doesn't work today all right we are not financing our roads effectively using the the gas tax so we have to look at alternate uh, uh, ways. And that involves road user charging. And of course, you're going to pay for transit. You're going to pay because you're getting value out of, you know, the transportation mode you're taking. But as I said before, we qualify people for all kinds of government benefits right now. We need to take that into account. Uh, social equity ha has to be a part of uh, how we determine who pays what. Because if we don't, we're never going to allow folks, for example, that are trapped in that cycle of, po of poverty to get out. Great. Allison, that almost goes back to the very first question almost that we got that someone asked you specifically what the major policy initiatives in the US are to promote and I guess to finance all of these. So what is your perspective? Is it public sector, private sector? Um, I think, honestly, because we treat transportation as its own sector um, and not an enabler for every other part of what we do, it, the government will probably have to be involved because I think, um, yes, there will be user pay, but when we look at those who, who are unable to pay um, just due to existing financial situations, we, we pick that up elsewhere. It could be in... Uh, chronic health issues that cost a lot more to deal with 10 years on. It could be in the fact that these individuals get stuck in low-wage jobs because they just can't get to school or they mm -hmm. can't get to a, a job where they could be making more money and, and pitching in more. We pay for it somewhere. And so in my mind, a mechanism to help us actually deal with these downsides uh, of not having access to transportation needs to be in place to be able to help create that that equalization and government has typically done those types of things so that seems to me like the right path but just figuring out how do we actually shift our thinking um i think is really critical in terms of what almost like insurance we, we buy insurance um hoping that nothing bad will happen but right. then if it does it's there it, it, it helps facilitate our lives in different ways. And thinking about this as like insurance, if we invest in transportation now, <laughs> we're avoiding bigger costs later, I think is a, a really critical perspective shift that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Avinash, Valerie, you want to add anything? We have to watch time a little bit. So maybe a quick statement, how to finance this transportation and mobility shift. I I think more sectors are going to come to the table. So for example, we're working with a major um, health insurance company, managed care organization. We're working with hospital systems, non-emergency medical transportation just for Medicaid and Medicare is a $17 billion business. Mm -hmm. 
And when we think about how much money as the United States invested in transportation in the government for transportation for seniors and individuals with disabilities, it's around $250 million a year. So you think about where's this breakdown and where are these pockets of money? Likewise, employers, the great employee shortage is upon us. And we're working with a number of different communities that you know, departments of economic development are saying we'll pay for the transportation. We just we can't shut down the plant because that's going to cost us more money. And so I think that there's there's other sectors that are going to have to come to the table to move things forward. Mm -hmm. That's just a quick I summary because I agree with everything here. If you think about it as a system, more segments can get involved in it. But we right now we're still stuck on how do we fund the initial purchase of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the individual and i think why aren't we looking at the business model that enables us to get access to transport to, to mobility and that's a fundamental shift because then you're not having to worry about the upfront cost and you can make it more affordable across the the life of that vehicle or yep. whatever yep. solution it is absolutely great thank you everybody and i i think what we heard also goes along those lines it's a lot about multimodal transportation i really liked uh, what um, i think allison said that mobility is actually if you walk to your car that's already not just transportation that is mobility and omara lewis for instance posted very good thoughts here as well i mean all of you did but i want to read this this one line that Walkability is one of the top indicators of livability so that you can actually walk to the bus stop, walk to this place, walk to that uh, station. That, that is a very important piece already to, to make it a more livable place and um, to not just get in your car and go uh, because there's so much more to explore as well if you, if you walk a city. So thank you, everybody. We certainly needed more time. I guess we will need a rerun. I'm definitely up for that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alison, John, Valerie, and, and Avinash. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day and uh, be in touch. Hopefully see you at WCX next week. I'll be there. Bye now. <laughs>